Hello, everyone, and welcome to a brand new Record Club episode of the Jams and Tea podcast, where we spin the jams, spill the tea, and we celebrate wonderful happenings in the world of music, of course, because we're talking today about a seminal post-punk release. We're going to be talking about, I mean, honestly, it's just kind of one of the most beloved albums of all time at this point. We're talking about The Queen is Dead by The Smiths. You're right, because in 2013, the NME, which is the kind of definitive UK music magazine, named this the greatest album of all time. Oh. Uh, on their, They did a 500 albums of all time, because they're basically the UK equivalent of Rolling Stone, and The Queen is Dead hit the top of the list. So this is a celebrated, beloved, and kind of timeless uh, UK yeah. jangle pop record. Uh, represents the kind of the pinnacle of the Smiths career. Uh, they were a band that kind of dominated the eighties for a short period of time, releasing four albums in quick succession, along with a number of other live recordings, compilations, uh, an incredible density of great music in the span of five years, max a band that essentially along with REM defined the jangle pop aesthetic in the 80s and almost redefined songwriting for a new generation in a certain sense as well particularly and again another thing that kinship they share with rem as well particularly a particular brand of i don't know how to phrase this right queer sexuality that is sort of explored in Teasingly elusive, half ironic, and somewhat Egg absurd pop. ways. It's a really difficult thing to describe, especially for someone who is super influenced culturally by both of these bands, but also was not around to experience that moment. But The Queen is Dead, the third Smiths album out of four, came out in 1986. So it is 36 years old now math how you do it uh it's 36 years old now and uh it is relevant once again because of recent happenings now i don't want to say that we are celebrating the death of britain's longest reigning monarch but we are certainly commemorating this event by using it as is our want as an excuse to talk about a seminal album of course because we are all about the music and we aren't you know sinking you spin the, the jams spill the british tea in the boston harbor yeah usa, exactly. USA. Oh! USA. and similarly while you know we're not that we're in any shade of people who shy away from political readings of our music or anything but it, needless to say as little as to do with that actually you know that it does we also uh we're not we're we we also have to come out and say that we're not big fans of Mr. One, one Mr. Morrissey because otherwise people will get mad at us. Yeah. Because the internet is a dumb place. So yeah, that's good to just get out of the way from the front of the back. Obviously, Morrissey is a a, a, a pretty a pretty reprehensible human being, all Cunt. things told. And like, so we're even, not gonna even if his politics were good, he's just kind of a jackass. So. Yeah. And hey, look, there's, that's not far in ground for us in terms of talking about musicians that we love and who have made music that we love. Uh, but yeah, that is just, let's just draw a line under that now because I don't want to talk about yeah. it anymore. Um, nah. Let's talk about The Queen is Dead. So it's maybe a shame that we had to rely on an occasion such as this to finally talk about the Smiths. I know that because of Morrissey, they're kind of a band that has become so shrouded in you know, the the fallout of his constant bullshittery, but they are one of the great bands of the 80s and they are one of the most consistent bands of that era. They are a band that left such a, a, an amazing impact on music in such a short period of time that you could compare them to the Velvet Underground or even Joy Division, who we talked about very recently in this series as well, in terms of impact within this incredibly dense and short period of time. And there's a lot of debate over, you know, any Smiths fan will have a different answer for you based on what their best album is, whether it's even one of the four main ones or whether it's one of the more 
one of the compilation records like Hatful of Hollow or Louder Than Bombs, for instance. My personal favorite Smith's record is actually the one that precedes this, Meat is Murder. But it's really difficult to pick a best Smith's album because they are all so, they all rise to such a, a solid, consistent level of excellence that, you know, it, it's it's apples and oranges at the end of the day but i think there's no denying that the queen is dead is the one with the greatest density of their most classic songs nearly every song on here has something fascinating to talk about in terms of its legacy or in terms of just what it is how it's written how it sounds it's an album of classic songs essentially and it's a record where i feel like again the discourse surrounding the people involved in making it and all that sort of thing and of course the fact that you know we're talking about it because of the death of the queen and it's all tied up in that sort of political aspect of it as well all that overshadows what an incredibly witty what an incredibly funny and also what an incredibly musically excellent album this is from front to back I mean, and let's talk about it. Let's talk about the title track of this record. Let's talk about the opening song. One of the most musically ambitious and kind of like uh, complex Smith songs, I suppose I would venture to say as well. Uh, it, it really demonstrates everything you need to know about how exciting this band can be, how deeply sardonic and witty Morrissey is as a writer, and also how relentlessly creative Johnny Marr is as a guitarist, not to mention as well, it's another one of those bands, I'm sure there's plenty others like it, where it's like, they're so dominated by, um, like a U2 is another one actually, where they're so dominated by these two kind of chief figures, the front man singer and the guitarist, that no one ever remembers the name of the rhythm section, so special shout out to Mike Joyce. And, and whoever the bassist is, because I, I don't remember. <laughs> Special shout out to Andy Rourke, bassist, and Mike Joyce, uh, drummer. Because, not just because, you know, it's a great they're a great band and it's worth shouting out every member, but they are, they really do put in the fucking work on this album, to be honest. And so much of what makes it so satisfying musically is not just what Johnny Marr is laying down, not just what they are laying down, but also how they're playing together and how they're composing together and how they're playing off of each other. And I think nowhere is that more excitingly or uh, ostentatiously displayed than the first song on this record. Um, Jake, Morgan, what do you guys think? Slaps. Holmes is dope. If you want to showcase the appeal of the Smiths to someone, I think that if, like, you know, somebody's like, hey, what's a good litmus test for whether or not I'm going to like this band? I think the title track's probably what I would show them. Because not only is it just a great introductory track, but it's also something that perfectly showcases why each member of this band is important and cool and unique. You have the interesting very kind of irreverent writing of morrissey here which is like it, it, he both he as a writer and a performer is is a very strange beast because i feel like he embodies post-punk so perfectly and that he's just so fucking weird like the intonation in his voice when he's just like and talk about precious things and i'm just kind of like why did you why did you say that like that it, it almost sounds like david byrne but it's also not quite there's nobody who's got a voice that's quite as strange or comparable as morrissey's and it makes so all his deliveries here stand flamingly, out flamingly flamingly homosexual Oh, God, I mean, no wonder this band accrued a lot of, like, you know, countercultural and queer rep over the years in terms of its fan base. I mean, you just listen to this and it's just like, oh, wow, this guy really was giving Robert Smith a run for his money in terms of pure fucking camp. Uh, mm -hmm. And that kind of translates to the sort of fiery musical performances tier, too. I mean, again, obviously, there's the kind of fiery performance that mar is is doing with some of these guitar licks on here but some of my favorite parts are actually the drums and the rhythm sections particularly the drums there are some absolutely insane cycling beats that happen especially like midway into this song that are just so fucking cool and really like it's very distinctly of the post-punk movement but it also definitely doesn't really feel like any other of their like contemporaries were making anything quite this eclectic especially around this time it really does feel like this band had a great grasp on how to still make tuneful 
interesting songs without you know sacrificing the fact that they were all a bunch of little fucking weirdos well yeah it's taking that aesthetic of a lot of those bands that you were talking about who or that you would have you weren't talking about explicitly but you know the the british tradition that we have talked about with joy division and all these sorts of other very austere bands as well and it's just injecting that with a sense of kind of levity and gentle self-mockery that is what made the smiths what they were that really made them stand out as well this was a band that were you know doing all of these things aesthetically but also injecting it with a really strong sense of humor uh really sort of self-effacing and kind of like witty mocking attitude uh really kind of insightful and pointed critiques about british society and about hypocrisies as morrissey saw it in the way in which the english in particular uh as he was someone who was originally born in ireland i believe as the english kind of carried out and enforced their very bizarre customs in in terms of like what was socially and culturally acceptable and what's i think worth noting about this song is that it's not even really an anti-monarchy song like it's kind of become a symbol of sort of anti-monarchy but it is really less of a song about the you know about the evil of the monarchy or whatever you want to project onto it and more a song about the as Morrissey sees it the bizarreness and kind of the unsettling unhealthiness of the fascination with the monarchy and the way in which they're kind of framed and given power by media essentially and how it's a really actually quite funny and I think well-toned commentary on how so much of the power of the monarchy, you know, which is a system that we associate with inherent self-reinforcing power, actually comes from the people themselves and from media and from how people choose to think about, frame, approach, understand this institution, essentially. And so what can the power to make it crumble, essentially, the power to dictate what it does and how it goes is actually in the hands of the people. Um, but that they are so caught up in the fantasy, essentially, and in what it means to their identity to have this sort of austere system in place in the late 20th century, that that no one has any interest in doing anything other than just blind reverence. And so it's a really funny song where uh, Morrissey is simultaneously like kind of really scathingly giving these sort of sarcastic uh, asides about the, these very poetic and sort of Oscar Wildean ways in which he describes, you know, the English culture and and backdrop and the sense of like apologetic Britishness and his sentiment of, um, you know, imagining what it would be like to see the Queen with her head in a sling, uh, and and the very funny line where he talks about uh, wanting to say to Prince Charles, now King Charles, don't you ever crave to appear on the front of the Daily Mail dressed in your mother's bridal veil, which is such a like. Uh, it's just a kind of like low key diss way of talking about how oh, much yeah. Charles, you know, uh, pretends not to envy or maybe truly does it envy, but still kind of sits in awe of the power that he is to inherit. The the really the really um, funny section where he talks about um, breaking into the palace with a sponge and a rusty spanner, which itself, the more you think about that, the funnier it gets. And this little. Uh, and this conversation he has with the queen where he's talking about where she says like, i recognize you and you can't say he's like that's nothing you should hear me play piano which is like it's just it's it's so quintessentially like sardonically morrissey that like it's it, it's it's hard to like imagine it coming from any other voice or any other voice being able to sell it the way that he does it's and we talk a little bit about sexuality and sensuality in camp uh now morrissey in the 80s and it's been discussed and debated and he's been very like elusive about it ever since his sexuality like how he defines it i think kind of a big part of the identity of morrissey the songwriter is a deliberate elusiveness about that so a refusal to be pinned down a refusal to describe himself in any particular way kind of just wanting to make people as uncomfortable as possible by having his sexuality and having his identity willfully remain as obscure and kind of ephemeral as possible and i respect that 
and I think it gives a lot of the music its power as well. The sense that you, yeah, you're you're hearing this incredibly camp figure who is playing a lot with the limits of and the cultural ideas surrounding the way that his voice sounds, the way that you know his accent sounds essentially, and the way that he's viewed and is toying with that or is using that as kind of leverage to kind of get one over the listener and in this era he was really really good at doing that and it was always in ways that felt really really satisfying i think of big mouth strikes again the way that he has his kind of his voice sort of pitched up on that chorus to for the big mouth part which is just so silly but at the same time it's kind of like one of those little tiny aspects of the way that he is kind of mocking the listener or mocking not the listener specifically but like anyone who is coming at this music from the framework of the sorts of things that he wants to play with or that he wants to rebel against or that he wants to kind of comment on yeah and he's really really smart about it i think and it's really really funny and a big part of what makes this album so enduring is the way that he is able to play with those expectations and able to kind of provoke gently in a very sort of camp way and i feel like that shouldn't be overlooked when talking about what this album is. I feel like so much of discussion around the Smiths is so, you know, swallowed up by the fact, oh, we need to get ahead of this. About We don't agree with Morrissey or Morrissey this, Morrissey that, blah, 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 blah. But actually all of the things that Morrissey is, that he has become in a more, you know, exaggerated and, you know, altogether reprehensible form are what make this album what it is all the same. Like that interaction between what Morrissey is doing and what his band are doing and the way in which they all kind of congeal together. I mean, that's what makes this what it is, and you can't overlook that. All right. N- enough more, see. We all know, right? Johnny Marr. It's, I mean, there, there are probably like three guitarists as important to the progression of alternative music of of rock music that are more important than Johnny Marr uh, well as important I don't I'm not sure anybody's more important and it's so interesting to talk about what makes Marr both so influential and just so fucking good and naturally it is all over this album it is of course a, a tonality where you can basically recognize a Johnny Marr riff from a million miles away, both in the sense of the tone of the guitar itself and the kinds of melodies, the phrasing of certain chords and chord progressions. The guy basically fundamentally altered the entire game while never busting out the most wicked terror ass solo you've ever heard in your life. That's, that's another thing that makes Mar so great is the fact that it was always, no matter what he was doing, it was always in service of the song mm. first and foremost. It, it's a really like interesting style that he has for the sort of music the Smiths are making because as you sort of hinted Morgan he's much more based like his playing is more based around texture than melody and like notes and all those sorts of things individually like it is all about yeah you, know, you, you when you think of Mar, you think of the Mar sound specifically. You don't even just think of the jangle pop sound. You think of specifically how Johnny Mar makes his guitar sound, the specific kind of weight. I mean, I when I think of Johnny Mar, I think of how soon is now in particular, like that song, which is not on this record to be fair, but that is the definitive uh, Smith song, I think, lyrically and musically. And a big part of it is how utterly foreign Mars guitar playing sounds there and it's absolutely translates through to this record as well i mean the soloing on the queen is dead the first track is just outrageously good i mean he's he's doing something that i would have never imagined johnny ma to do yet makes perfect sense and he makes it work which is the way he's using the wah pedal on this solo like he's he's making his he's kind of using and leaning into an aesthetic that 
I, I, to me, I associate with some of the more garish aspects of eighties guitar soloing and playing like, but he, he makes it feel so thoroughly Marian that it works like, and, and it's a really distinct tone. And that's maybe one of my favorite things about this album is that you get the Mar tone, but you get it manifesting in so many different ways. It never sounds exactly the same across the entire record. It's a, it's a really, it's a real sign of a, of a visionary and of someone who is so like at this point with a, a few records under his belt, so refined and confident in how we can explore different sounds. And, you know, taking a lot, sure, from the influence of players like, I don't know, Tom Verlaine, for instance, but channeling all of that into his own aesthetic. And it would go on to influence so many players. I mean, you could argue Mar is, is probably the single most influential uh guitarist of the eight British guitarist of the 80s in terms of like you wouldn't have Johnny Greenwood in the same way yeah. you wouldn't have um the edge in the same way you wouldn't have like all these other players who were obviously borrowing so heavily from Ma and it's so consistent across this record as well that beautiful just gorgeous spacious tone that he's able to capture it's kind of uh interesting that we talk about this in such close proximity to i think someone who's very similarly regarded and uses their instrument in a very similar way which is uh bernard sumner of joy division and that i think both of these bands really not just because they're like seminal post-punk acts and they have these albums that are sort of foundational but because they really embody you know the combination of the core two things that make up the genre of post-punk and that you can very very easily hone in on where the sort of you know sex pistols the clash influence on these bands would sort of operate around whether or not well i mean sometimes the influence would be in the reverse there but you still get what i mean in that you can tell that these guys came from the punk rock scene and really it's that they're melding with their far stranger less forwardly aggressive melodies and rhythms that are designed to sort of you know in, in a punk rock way kind of get the people going get these melodies stuck in their heads so that they remember the words it's it's very you know protest music kind of stuff whereas this is sort of taking the spirit of that and then channeling it into something else that feels totally alien to where it began even if you can still kind of trace it i think there's no better showcase of that than like you have such an kind of austere and ambitious opening on here and then immediately you go into frankly mr shankly which is a silly ass song oh i love it, it it's yeah so, it's so funny it's the like very some beginning of... it's just like the burn, 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 burn. <laughs> just like what's happening like, now i just want to shout out like this is super like this song to me is super kinks esque and it is just so yes thoroughly yes. Morrissey. Like it's just like a classic example right, of like man, how funny Morrissey could be in this I era. Mean. Like almost every line in the song feels iconic in its own way. Like I've got the 21st century breathing down my neck. I must move fast. You understand me. I want to go down celluloid history. I love the the part of the song where he's like, sometimes I feel more fulfilled making Christmas cards with the mentally ill. I want to live and I want to love. I want to catch something I might be ashamed of. Like it's, it's, these things sound maybe quaint to us now, but like it's, it's, it's really funny how, just kind of subtly he's digging into things that are like just you know off color enough for him to, for the british you know uh media to be kind of scandalized but also like not so off color that if they were to be scandalized morrissey could point back at them and say well actually what about this is upsetting you and what does that say about you like mm -hmm. it is super it just undermines and undercuts so much of what at the time, and this was, I suppose, admittedly getting less and less true in the 80s, but what at the t up to that point had been this thoroughly imbued and embedded sense of prudishness and snotty kind of like, it was so, you know, thoroughly imbued in the British identity that it ultimately came to be such a stereotype in association with them as well. And Morrissey is just, just, just doing enough to just dig into that and kind of almost like troll in a certain sense or just kind of like dare you to get upset a little bit um but also like the the, the best line in um 
the the song is uh when he kind of talks about and it's hard to say whether he's talking to Mr. Shankly here or whether it's like his employer kind of like uh commenting back at him when he's like, I didn't realize you wrote poetry. I didn't realize you wrote such bloody awful poetry. Bloody awful poetry. <laughs> it's it's really funny. It's kind of like a self-effacing dig, but it's also just like equal parts a snotty kind of fuck you as well. Like it's it's just a really funny song. And yeah, and you're right. The dynamic of the Smiths is the fact that this is back to back with a song as musically dark and intense as the Queen is dead. And then again, going into one of the most melodramatic songs on the record and my personal favorite song on this album, uh, I Know It's Over, which Great is song. like a, definitely like a top three five top five smith song for me like both in terms of the fact that i think this is one of morrissey's greatest vocal performances and some of ma's best work and they are just at 10 for the entire song here and it's not the only one where they're both at 10 but man this is the one that i've always resonated with the most ever since i first got into the smiths when i was like 15 and the way that Morrissey will just draw lines out in the song and make them feel like a thousand yards long and make the emotion feel so melodramatic in a way that feels super true to the sensibility you feel around that age. And the way he just kind of like, he has a great ability to like just dig into a particular line and like really make you feel it and kind of beat it into you. Like the way he repeats, if you're so funny, then why are you on your own tonight? Clever, entertaining, good looking, just these constant like uh, just attacks essentially at the listener or at this uh, individual that the song is pitched towards essentially who is basically rejecting uh Morrissey essentially and making him feel as though he's dying and the soil is falling over his head like it's super again melodramatic but it's the exact kind of melodrama that this band are so good at ever since I started listening to Smith's albums in full uh this one I know it's over has pretty much been my favorite on here at least in one of my favorite Smith's tracks in general probably top three or at least top five i also really enjoy the jeff buckley cover that is on one of those compilations yeah it, to me in a lot of ways it's entirely definitive of the smiths it's morrissey's peak lyricism i would say and mars guitar work especially on when the fuller lead parts come in and various portions of the song really fill the entire thing out and add so much texture and life to it and it's i worship at the altar having this one back to back with never had no one ever is like it is like you have to understand when i was 15 this shit like was like it was like a, a fucking hotline to god like this, this is like the man is speaking my language with these two songs back to back. Like they're so maudlin, they're so ridiculously over the top, and they're so like melancholic in a way that's just so like <laughs> bleeding heart, broken, fucking very shit. Very the cure. And like yeah, I know exactly. it's kind of an over. It's an overdone comparison, but it's overdone just because like this album shares everything in common with records like disintegration i mean never had no one ever legitimately is just like this just sounds like lullaby sometimes a little bit yeah and like i mean this song is pathetic like if you <laughs> just sit here and, and read these lyrics they're just kind of embarrassing you're just be a fucking loser like basically you know most of the lines in the song is just morrissey trailing off and because he's so fucking heartbroken and just pining and shit and it's it's the truest way of communicating that he doesn't dress it up unnecessarily and um i had a really bad dream it lasted 20 years seven months and 27 days it's like such a fucking like it actually reminds me a lot of that lyric from uh slow show you know i dreamed about you for 29 years before i saw you from the national which again we talked about that very recently as well and it's just like another little parallel a, a, almost, a band i almost feel and two like guitarists <laughs> undoubtedly massively influenced by uh -huh. this band and i almost feel like if i were to, if someone would ask matt berninger if that 
this the lyric in this song was influential on that he would probably have to admit that it was because i know how much he was influenced by jangle pop and rem and i assume the smiths as well but yeah it's it's just a delightfully fucking just intensely crushing song that's also kind of like so pathetic that you can't even really get depressed about it it's just kind of like oh it's it's holding a mirror up oh yeah this is why i got into them in high school yeah exactly sense and i think that may be why a part of the reason why so many people react against the smiths now and they use kind of morrissey as an excuse because they listen to this music and they see morrissey essentially holding a mirror up to the emotions and the way that they felt at a time that they're not proud of and they they fit you physically recoil from that if you aren't like if you haven't dealt with that yet and accepted that that's the way that you were it's so earnest that it's an easy target you know that's why a lot of the backlash even happens is that it's it's just because morrissey is putting himself on display for like even if like even if morrissey was fine if his legacy had nothing to do with him being a shitty ass person people would just be like oh i don't like the smiths because they're so like maudlin and emotional and meanwhile you got me right here being like yeah uh-huh and and they'll point to yeah songs, they'll point to songs like cemetery gates as well which is like a song that has layers to it like it's both a song you know that is about morris essentially kind of talking himself up like and sort of saying like you know you're all about you know this sort of romanticized he, he uses the language of poets here like he talks about keats and yates who are like these very romantic poets and he compares himself to oscar wilde who's of course a much more sort of like sardonic sort of like just someone who he plays with the image of these particular artists and he kind of uses it as a parallel to the way that he's viewed. But also people will see that level to the song and they'll like point it and say, oh, Morrissey thinks so highly of himself. But if you actually read into the additional layers of the songs as well, it's as much of a piss take on himself as it is on on the you know the other people that he's talking about in the song as well. Like it is, it's it's both a commentary on like an, an admission of the way in which Morrissey chooses to see himself in order to make himself feel superior to people who have never liked him or have treated him badly. But it's also an admission of the fact that Morrissey is, you know, adopting and doing this as a defense mechanism and essentially leaning into all of this incredibly melodramatic, super 20th century, haughty torty narcissistic way of viewing the world, essentially. And he writes in ways that are like so just it's it's really funny to me. Uh, if you must write prose and poems, the words you use should be your own. Don't plagiarize or take on loan because there's always someone somewhere with a big nose who knows and who trips you up and laughs when you fall. Who'll trip you up and laugh when you fall. You say, ear long, done, do, does, did. Words which could only be your own and then produce the text from whence was ripped. Some dizzy whore, 1804. Like there's so whence. much going on there about like just taking the piss out of you know everything that songwriters do and everything that poets do and it's it's just really funny it's really smart and it's really like yeah it's narcissistic but also at the same time it's it's throwing a spanner into the face of everyone not just and and into your own face as well like it even uses that like you know, the, the emo idea of like meeting at the cemetery gates and kind of like, you know, uh, reading sort of romantic poetry together in this kind of dark state. And then it kind of undercuts that by deliberately misspelling a cemetery to show how this is just an image that Morrissey has constructed essentially. And he, he's every bit as cheesy and corny and, and like vulnerable to how self-indulgent it all is as anyone else is like, yeah if that makes sense it's just everyone is a target on this record including morrissey and that's one of the things that makes it so age so well i think is that it all it still feels relevant a lot of the critiques that he's pulling and also a lot of the ways in which he kind of doubles up and throws everything back at himself as well just morrissey being a little shit goblin for 40 minutes basically you know when i was listening to cemetery gates specifically I, the the vibe I got now it just goes to show you how far the influence of this band's went and I mean obviously the artist I'm about to mention uh name drops one of their songs um but the the lyricism I couldn't get past here is I'm just like Cemetery Gates is just a proto Phoebe Bridgers song like everything about this is so like j- just throwing a reference to her listening to some fucking song on the radio and it's like yep that's yep that just goes right there goes all together 
How soon is now indeed? A CVS. <laughs> oh no. Not the CVS. Yeah, and I mean, the vibe continues on Big Mouth Strikes Again, which, I mean, I don't even need to talk about that because I've already alluded to it for one, but it's it's the same sort of thing. Like, but it's more deliberately poking fun at Morrissey himself. Like, again, if Cemetery Gates is kind of like, you know, the barbs are pointing in all directions, Big Mouth Strikes Again really makes it explicit that Morrissey kind of like, I guess you could, if you were less charitable, you could read this as Morrissey kind of like trying to get ahead of any criticism of himself by writing this kind of shallow song about, oh, you know, I'm such a big mouth. But I do think like it's, he gets away with it because it's a genuinely funny song. And because the things he says about himself are so ridiculous that there's no way he comes out looking like he's trying to make himself look great. I mean, he compares no. himself to fucking Joan of Arc. <laughs> and he, so it's like, it's really obvious how like you know deliberately provocative he's being and i mean that opening line as well of sweetness i was only joking when i said i'd like to smash every tooth in your head it's <laughs> it's really funny and it's just it's, were you it's... though dog <laughs> i was only joking when i said by right you should be bludgeoned in your bed i love the way he sings it's so good i i just love the pitch of that big mouth <laughs> it harmonizes with his normal vocals. It kills me. It's so fucking like it takes advantage of the fact that his accent is like just kind of off enough when he sings to make him sound really like it, it, it's it's still you're just listening to this like folk Gaelic singer taking the piss out of people and it's so silly. Well, one of the many uh, cuts that are on here that like are shorter but still remain a bit of a highlight for me mm. even though they're like this is an album that has like some five minute songs and two minute songs but it's one of the few that maybe with one exception that manages to make even its slighter moments feel more essential than perhaps other bands might have absolutely i mean it helps that it's so jaunty i mean this was the lead single for the album and yeah. it is like ma said as well he was trying to basically write his jump and jack flash with the way he composed this and it is so like you know it's so it barrels forward it has such a momentum and such a heft to it uh, for a you know a jangle pop song that it's really really addictive and morrissey because a lot of what happens in this era is that essentially mar and the rhythm section would essentially compose these songs together and then give them over to morrissey and he would essentially riff and write over top of them and so he is like the thing that makes this a, an amazing song is that it's got the the amazing musicality but it's also got morrissey's talent for crafting really addictive hooks at its peak and together you just get a perfect pop song basically and that energy continues into the boy with the thorn is in his side which is my second favorite song on this album very closely behind i know it's over they're basically equals to me uh this to me i mean morrissey said this was his favorite smith song and i have to say i think that this is one of the definitive smith songs i think it's one of the most one uh -huh. of my favorite songs in, from a writing perspective but also again i think this is one of morrissey's greatest performances ever as well like so much of the emotion and the maudlin nature of the way he performs is just absolutely tuned to perfection here it's just a gorgeous gorgeous piece of music this might have been the second or third smith song i ever heard after i read and watched perks of being a wallflower and just went onto youtube just tearing ass through yeah that's what we, we we both did that uh, <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah and and this this one's always been uh an absolute favorite of mine um another one of mars compositional peaks every melody on this song is like unfucking touchable like even though it's a song about the music industry um fairly blatantly like the way that he talks about how can they hear me say those words and still they don't believe me like the sense of you know credulousness that um Morrissey was kind of striving for but never really seemed to get and again I think on some level he knew he understood why that was because he was trying to be you know both this deliberately sincere kind of bleeding heart poet and also kind of trying to undercut the whole idea of that at the same time but this is I think the song I mean, one of the reasons why this is my favorite Smith song is that 
it's where his desire to be you you get for all the mocking of romantic poets on cemetery gates this is like the moment where along with you know there is a light that never goes out which we'll get to this is the moment where you you see the facade of morrissey kind of fall away and you see what a romantic person he really is even as much as he wants to deny that and you see the longing to be accepted as someone who is just all of these very two-dimensional things essentially but that still feels them very very deeply and i think one of the reasons why this album endures so much is that this side of morrissey which you seldom really get to see all that long it does kind of bleed through the cracks in between these more ironic moments and this to me is you know, the least ironic, the least kind of sarcastic, the least sort of mocking song on the record. It's just a genuine plea in a certain sense to be understood. And this to me is one of the most definitive lyrics that Morrissey's ever written about himself, where he talks about behind the hatred there lies a murderous desire for love, like describing his desire for love as murderous. This idea that you know, he, a moment of recognition that essentially he all, all that he ever really ever wanted at the end of the day is love like you know like the, the cliche the obvious thing we all kind of want is to be you know uh, loved in some sense but that no matter what he was always going to get in his own way of that that he was always going to, that was always going to be blinded by the id essentially that morrissey was unable to kind of like keep pinned down and he was always going to his murderous instincts, you know, more metaphorically than literally, of course, were always going to kind of rise to the surface and dominate that part of him that wants to be loved. And it's kind of a really sort of like, it's almost a, you know, a, I've been thinking a lot about Paul Schrader recently, just because he's been in the news a lot. And I've been thinking a lot about his movies and it's kind of a similar sort of sentiment as what he writes into basically all of his screenplays is as well is this desire to be, completely candid and completely accepted and just completely you know human in the most vulnerable of ways that is disguised or covered up by this layer of artifice that is put in place as a defense mechanism essentially and that's you know it's like a fundamental tragedy of masculinity in, in a certain sense uh and i don't know like i'm getting way into the weeds with it here but to me this song is just like it so perfectly gets that and it's like a skeleton key for, for Morrissey as a human being while only having like, you know, two or three lines essentially in the whole song that are just repeated over and over and over and over and over. Like, I, and I think to, on some level, Morrissey understands and accepts that because he says it's his favorite Smith song. It's the one he's most proud of. So we think on some level, he recognizes that this is the truest communication of who he is um but you know because of the way he is and this is not making any excuses but just because of the way he is he'll never be able to get out of his own way and that's the fundamental tragedy of morris as a human being and that's one of the key takeaways of this album and that's why i love it so much how, how about that penultimate track though yeah i mean okay so one of the reasons why this album is imperfect is that sandwiched between these two amazing songs is Vicar a Tutu, which is fine. Yeah. Which is fine. Fucking, but it's not fine. ultimately like it's, it's one of those It's fine, but shut up, dude. It's one of those little kind of two minute tossed off songs that like the reason why Strange Ways He'll Become is their worst album is because the first half is amazing. And the second half is just a bunch of these types of songs. <laughs> anyway, the forget that for a second. It is the worst song on this album. Even though I don't hate it. And I kind of no, do find yeah. a bit of the few of the scene it's funny, but like it's it's kind of like perfectly illustrating my point of Morrissey getting in his own way because if this were back to back with Thorn, then you'd have like you'd have maybe so much candidness and like romanticism from Morrissey that he would be uncomfortable with it. And maybe to a certain extent, that's why he kind of shoves Vicar in a tutu in there and then puts some girls are bigger than others after it to kind of like you know almost mm -hmm. take the piss out of the fe genuine feeling that he's established up to this point like it's so morrissey but you know anyway these songs in and of themselves uh thorn which i've already talked about and then this which is like the smith song 
like in general like if you were to pick one that is the most recognized remembered revered it's this one i mean like if you oh, yeah. were like the three of us you know i i was aware of smith before i read perks of being a wallflower but they certainly animated my interest that book certainly yeah, animated well, my interest in the well. smiths and a big you know when you read that book the first song you want to go and listen to is this one like this is the you know it, it's everything that people think of the smiths that they associate with the Smiths, that all the most appealing, I think, and the most kind of attractive aspects of the Smiths in one song. And it's just titanic. I mean, you guys can probably describe it better than me. I've said enough. It's one of those songs that I hadn't listened to in a while before we planned to do this review. And I threw it on again, uh, just when listening to this album again. And realized that I've heard it, I want to say, 8,000 times <laughs> at minimum. It's like so perfect. It's like Sunday Morning by the Velvet Underground. It's just like yes, in, ineffable and singularly indicative of why so many people fell for something. This is the first song I heard from this album, just because, of course, the first Smith songs I heard was Asleep. But there's, again, this is another one of those quintessential examples of songs that just kind of showcase every member of the band operating at, like, their peak powers. But I think a comment we made earlier is truly emblematic here, is that they all do get their moments to shine, but it is still always in service of the song. Because, like, even the best musicians... Like, you know, you think about like a quintessential great guitarist like uh, Clapton, for example. And there's there's so many examples of where he is the blatant highlight of the song and everything around him suffers greatly because of that. Whereas here, none such the case is that everybody is doing what they do at their absolute best, but somehow managing to get the synthesis just right and not overpowering each other it gives everything a little bit of room to breathe like to the point where morrissey's performance vocals and like just like every tiny little aspect about this it's like it is unchangeably perfect it, it's just one of those totemic songs that like i, I can't help but fully just a, a tiny little itty bitty bit yeah i mean it's 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 musical perfection essentially not even just how it sounds but also again the way that morrissey sings i mean the lyrics are like so classic that they've almost kind of passed into the canon take me out tonight yeah. where there's music and there's people and they're young and they're alive like i i always like i'll always remember the way he sings i want to see people and i want to see life like the way he sings that is like someone That's who's so never cool. felt alive before but wants to be able to bask in it for a very short time and or, or just it, someone who doesn't feel it very often but knows exactly where to go when he wants to feel it and yeah, it's so emblematic and ultimately of this can't help but bring themselves back to this image of death and this image of death as this romantic thing and it's like something that's so true to how you think about it at a certain stage of your life like and how you know the romant if you subscribe to a particular strand of romanticism or even if you're just particularly really just awfully sickeningly in love that <laughs> it can be so easy to romanticize uh, a kind of perfect union that lasts forever through something like this like it's almost like goes back to shakespeare to be honest like it, it, yeah. it is it's and, and and this is the you know the, the 20th century equivalent you know of the of the romeo and juliet you know of the the monologue essentially of the the, the romeo monologue essentially I mean, it's morrissey what that is. Mor uh, morrissey is just irl hamlet motherfucker is is so histrionic and reactionary i i wish that he was dead just so i could go r.i.p morrissey you would have loved hamlet <laughs> r.i.p <laughs> hamlet you would have loved morrissey yeah that's the what i was there we go there we go that's <laughs> better like the timelines are but that's funny because it's nonsense yeah i like it <laughs> um, <laughs> um but yeah uh -huh. and then like morgan you see something 
yesterday that I really liked, uh, which is like, you know, you described the closer on this, you know, some girls are bigger than others as like, you know, absolute pinnacles of musical achievement. Do you want to maybe talk about this song a little bit and, and what your thoughts are? Like, if you break this song down to a molecular level, it's like better than fucking Beethoven. Yeah. Like, there's like a dozen riffs in this song and they're all main melody hook worthy of another completely separate song yeah they're just all shoved into this one and it's like mother fuck dude it's like the best rem songs like fucking harbor coat or near wild heaven yeah or you know those songs from that early rem era where you just have like peter buck is like fucking shoving so many different melodies into the song that you can barely even keep up with how the many fucking melodies there are. Is, it's like it's like sparkling with radiance this is this is as good as a guitar can ever possibly sound and and the, the rhythm section is so tight the bass especially mm-hmm. is just like i love I love, I've been listening to a lot of the radio department lately, and that'll be relevant soon to a video on this channel. But um, I, one of the things I love about them is that they'll have like a, a needlessly complicated bass line on a really simple sort of like, you know, warm, ethereal, nocturnal song. And I love that. I love when the, the bass line is just needlessly complex, just to add, yes. keep you on your toes. And Andy Rourke is so good at doing that in this band. Like he's so, so smart about it. And he, and again, so locked in with Mike Joyce as well and Mar. And the funny story, of course, about the song is that, you know, those three kind of composed it and worked it all together. And Mar said, I was really proud of this song. Like I was particularly proud of this one. And he gave it to Morrissey and Morrissey returned with these lyrics. And I actually think that you know, lyrically as juvenile and silly as the song is it kind of has an astute point to make and which is kind of this it's just this idea essentially that like you know trivializing or uh infantilizing or like um you know objectifying essentially women is is this is a you know it's a such a childish thing to do essentially or even becoming obsessed with aesthetics in general about people and about how we decide what beauty is essentially is so like pathetic basically and this idea that you know some people some girls are bigger than others essentially this goes back to the ice age uh to the egyptian you know era of antony and cleopatra and it's just this really like (laughs) ridiculous song that morrissey is writing and i used to kind of hate it to be honest i used to be like what the fuck is this bigger than other girls mothers and i think i always (laughs) thought that before i kind of you know understood essentially what Morrissey was doing here but even aside from what he's doing intentionally with the lyrics another th- reason why I appreciate it is that how understated and kind of ridiculous and sort of simplistic the lyrics are it kind of just works because it gives you a little bit more space to appreciate how much fucking shit is happening musically in yeah. this song like if Morrissey were going off on one then it would almost be like too much you would barely be able to keep up with anything uh, but you kind of can because of how simplistic Morrissey's approach is here and maybe he understood that to a certain extent again like I was saying before it almost feels like after the candid romanticism of the last song he's almost like scared of being in that mode for too long so he immediately needs to do something really juvenile to just kind of cut that off essentially or just sort of like make you think that was all just an act and not the real him so it's a real like it's a telling little moment of like you know his own sort of insecurities and also just a really infectious and addictive little song that you could study you know it could be taught in a class on how to compose and uh structure a really effective and and, and sophisticated pop song and that's it's only sense, fitting I, that it disarm you until the very end yeah yeah exactly and in that sense it's kind of like maybe a more appropriate comparison for the smiths would be less so like jangle pop like rem or post-punk like joy division and more so like sophista pop bands like prefab sprout for instance or even the kind of like uh sort of class conscious jangly angular stuff that bands like 
Boingo Boingo and XTC were X- doing. It I was going to say English Settlement XTC is yeah. maybe one of the, the biggest comparison points when I was listening to this as someone who had not heard XTC before they had heard this and then now who I yeah. have. That's that essentially. It is the Queen is dead and it holds up to this day. I wasn't actually sure how well it was going to hold up when we decided to do this and I was like, I have to revisit this because I hadn't listened to it in years. Um, but I was really pleasantly surprised by how well I think this all, all, most of these songs stand up to this date. And I think that it's still probably the best way of getting into this myth. It's still probably the most consistent, holistic picture of what made them great in that era. Probably it's... the ideal way to get into this wave of post-punk, because like I like and think that to some degree that like you know the cure for example are always going to be the apex of this movement for me personally and i think that there are like higher achievements that that band would go on to achieve but if you're recommending somebody get into the genre it's like well all of the cures albums that are really great are nine hours long and all of the ones that are super short are really derivative of other bands that you should probably recommend to them first and then there are other post-punk acts like joy division that are like yeah if you're not in the right mindset or you know generally speaking you just consider yourself to be an amicable happy person you might not particularly enjoy joy division (laughs) that much so the smiths is a nice balancing act where they they kind of got a tighter rein in on their their structure but they still have the the life and vitality but you know also they're gloomy enough to to suit that need Mm, absolutely favorite tracks and ratings let's go jake why don't you lead us off uh three favorite tracks gonna say yeah there is a light that never goes out and some girls are bigger than others are two flawless perfect songs and uh solid runner up with i know it's over uh least favorite yeah vicar in a tutu it's really the only thing on here that i think is in any way like just you know doesn't need to be here and the end product would be better but a strong uh strong eight out of ten for me nice to revisit an old classic and have it be as good as i remember yeah i know it's over uh some girls are bigger than others and boy with the thorn in his side um, um least favorite obvious is obviously picker and tutu i mean if you say anything else you're incorrect i'm saying like em- empirically wrong least favorite is picker um, amelia from bloodborne no raw i will give this an eight and a half out of ten all right my favorite songs on this album are i know it's over the boy with the thorn on his side and the queen is dead uh, my least favorite is Vicar in a 2-2, and I give the album an 8 out of 10, which gives us an average overall of 8.2 for The Smiths, The Queen is Dead. Let us know what you think of this album. Is it your favorite Smiths record? Is there a different record you prefer? Let us know in the comments below. You give us your Smiths rankings if you want to. We want to know what this band means to you and what these records mean to you. If you enjoyed this video, please consider giving it a like and subscribing to the channel. If you're listening on Apple or Spotify, you can head on over to the link in the description to do just that. If you want to go above and beyond and support us even more, you can hit the join button. And for just $1 a month, you can support us directly, become a member of the Jams and Tea family, get your name in the title call of every video on this channel. Plus, if you want to recommend us some music to listen to and talk about, your recommendation will go to the top of the pile. Rock over London, rock on Chicago, Henry Kissinger, you're next. <laughs>